Hey everyone, Benji here coming at you from the Contractor Evolution Studio. Now, in the context of construction and trades, the terms project management and project manager have become somewhat watered down. The unfortunate truth here is that in our industries, most project managers are actually just professional firefighters who honestly are doing their absolute best, but what they're missing are the fundamentals that make the science of project management what it is in other industries, right? So if you look to manufacturing or automotive, big tech or oil and gas, you'll see their PMs are following a set of guiding principles and best practices that allow them to complete projects of unimaginable scope and complexity on time and on budget. So this gap is something that our guest on the show today, Paul Atherton, helps address within the companies he coaches for Breakthrough Academy. Uh, prior to becoming a BTA coach five years ago, Paul was a professional engineer for a decade, and he spent about 10 years project managing super large construction projects across various countries around the world. And since joining Breakthrough Academy, Paul has worked with over 100 contractors, helping them achieve significant growth and success. And one of the cornerstones of his coaching philosophy is the implementation of world-class project management systems. So this episode is a deep dive into a few things. Uh, first, he tells us how and why project management is lagging behind in most construction companies, which I found really interesting. Second, uh, he shares with us the four project management fundamentals he helps entrepreneurs implement to drastically improve their net profit. And lastly, he speaks to the specific profile of person that truly excels in project management roles. So let's learn a little bit more about the bitter truth around project management with Paul Atherton. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school, and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Hey, Paul, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to do this. I'm excited to be here. So, okay, you have... Um, you have a lot of reps under your belt. You've worked with dozens and dozens of construction companies over the years. You work on their project management systems all the time. So very broad, very wide uh, perspective on this. I want to ask you this one to start. What have you observed over the years about project management in general and, and project managers? Project management is a, is a very well-evolved um, uh process and way of accomplishing goals on a project within a specific set of constraints. Unfortunately, what I've seen is that uh, project managers and trades businesses and general contracting businesses like residential and commercial construction, um, though they're given the title project manager, they're not actually following uh, specific processes. In most cases, they're actually just kind of out there fighting fires right. and, 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 and just you know, working hard with a lot of intentionality and a lot of them are well-intentioned, but processes that they're um, following are actually uh, pretty loose, uns unsophisticated yeah. and loose. Yeah. I I've heard you say before, like um, the, w the word or the term or the idea of project management over the years has become really diluted. Yeah. But, like, what do you mean by that? It, it, like if you look at a, uh, uh, a project manager who works for like, uh, you know, the government yeah. or a project manager that works for, you know, uh, like a big a car manufacturing sure. company, like, like those, those people all follow like a specific process and they all, f they all like speak the same language with respect to project management, even though they're in, like, I'd consider vastly different, in different in industries. Um, in trades businesses and, and like we said, general contracting businesses, what we've seen are people with the title project management, but the what they're doing is vastly different than the first group right. that mm -hmm. I just talked about. So it's, it's pr it, your project manager in title only. The actual yeah. practices that you employ, the habits, the systems are not there a lot of the time. Yeah, it's interesting in this industry, right? Like we, in, we have... Um, uh, in, in contracting, there's not a ton of definition around what it means to be a true professional, right? And, and I think that we can all see this, but 
if we go look at the accounting world or legal or whatever it is, or a pilot, it, there's a designation of what yeah. it means. If yeah, you're yeah. like a CPA, you're a CPA. The standard uh, is the standard. The standard is the standard. crystal yeah. clear. And it's, and it's widely understood. It's widely understood in contracting. Uh, it's still like the wild, wild west, right? Just because you develop someone to kind of look after some people and some projects and you give them a black, nice, shiny new lariat, it doesn't mean that they're a professional project manager. Right? No, no, not at all. Um, I, I want to, I want to like hear from Paul, how, like, is this, is this super prevalent? Is it, is it widespread? Is it very, very common, this sort of dilution? Yeah. 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 Um, we, we, like there's a spectrum, of course, like you, we come across companies where they're just like, there's no project management fundamentals that they're following at all. And then there's people that are doing an okay job at it, but, um, very rarely have I come across a company that's, you know, um, operating their project management office at kind of an A-class or world-class okay. level. Yeah. So let's start, uh, like I said a second ago, the standard is the standard. I, I t- can you have a, do you have a story, an insight, a, a memory about seeing like an excellent project management system or an excellent project manager at work? What does that actually look like? Early in my career, um, when I finished school, I was on a massive construction project. We were uh, we were building a cogeneration plant and there was a, a guy on there. He's an old engineer. Everyone loved him. You know, everyone respected him. He always seemed to just get everything done. He, he just, he just commanded like, you know, a couple hundred people under him and he was always so calm. He's always just walking around, you know, sipping his coffee. And, and, uh, you know, w- one day, you know, I, I didn't know what I was doing back then. I said to one of my peers on the site, I said, you know, he never looks like he's doing anything. <laughs> All he does is just walk around, sipping his coffee, chatting with people, holding meetings and, and life is good. And I'm running around with a clipboard and, you know, all concerned with my walkie talkie and, and just, you <laughs> Grinding. Know, just trying to, just trying to juggle all these balls at once and, and, and try and, try and, uh, trying to not drop any of them. And, and uh, the fellow I was talking to said, well, the reason why he acts like that is because he's just a really good engineer slash project manager. He's just planned everything to a T. He knows how to manage communication he knows how to manage people he's well experienced and the projects just run really really well and I went okay well there's a big gap between his performance and my performance here so if I could paint the picture of what good project management looks like that's I think I think like that fellow kind of he portrayed like a, like a really uh, like that's the life that we as project managers we want to try to attain tangible outcomes of good project management though uh, yeah I think are two things One, we want relationships amongst all the people involved in the project, like, you know, engineers, architects, the client, uh, people on your project team, vendors, just just all those people, the municipalities that you're working with and such. We want those relationships to elevate through the project's life cycle. Like get better as the the job progresses. Exactly. We want people to just continually get more comfortable working with one another and develop more respect for each other. And a good project manager will really increase the likelihood of that happening. That, that Like, I don't think that's the case a lot of the time, though. Like, no, as you no. get close to the finish line, the the vibe on site gets more tense, the conversations get shorter, if there's a level of awkwardness. Like, it's, I, I don't, you, you say the relationship improves when this is done really well. That that's, strikes me as, like, in stark contrast to the reality for most project managers and how their projects go. Would that be fair to say? 100%. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep, and it's just, and you can see it when you go into some of these sites. The culture is quite bad, and oftentimes it starts out really well because everything's new. You just got a bunch of money, you got a new contract, you got all these cool materials showing up on site, and you got this big plan and all these fancy drawings and everything. And you're like, okay, life's good, and then people start communicating. Yeah, mm-hmm, or right? or lack or don't or lack thereof. Oh well, no no no! People communicate. They have no problems communicating with each other. <laughs> I think, but it's just the quality of the communication is lacking and a good project manager will ensure that the communication, the content of the communication is such that I think relationships will, will tend to elevate. And that's just what you need. If you want to run a clean project, you need the team performing uh, and functioning at a, at a high level. I want our listeners to remember uh, just what Paul said a second ago about that, that excellent project manager on the Cogen site who's sipping his coffee, like calm, cool, collected all the time, not racing around from mm-hmm. job site to job site, putting God knows how many kilometers on the vehicle, red in the face from stress, like on the phone, you know, 40 times a day. That's, I mean, 
you know, while a project manager that looks like that is obviously doing their absolute best, would it be fair to say that if you see that, that's a symptom of poor project management like systems that underpin the company? Yep. Okay. 100%. Okay, yep. so I got a question for you as well. How, like, when you work with a business, and you and can, you're, can you're I get, actually cut in real quick? Totally, there's, totally. Besides the elevated relationships on a good, uh, like on a good project, there's there's um, one other thing that you tend to see is uh, change order adjusted budgets and schedules being met often mm-hmm. in the organization. Okay, and I think this is really important to mention because I think a lot of cultures and. And, or in organizations, like we said, in trades businesses and and, uh, g- and general contracting businesses, they just accept the status quo that, oh, you know, we just don't meet our schedules because of all these outside factors that we can't control. Or we don't meet our budgets because, you know, that's just the nature of the business we're in. Like that's become normalized. Exactly. And it really doesn't have to be that way. Hmm. Right? The, the, there are companies out there that don't accept this as the, as the norm. Hmm. So, that's really interesting. Yeah. They're like, ah, it's just construction. Yeah. It's yeah. like you win some, you lose some. Let's keep moving. At least we're making money. Right. Right. Yeah. But in your experience, that's absolutely not the case all the time. And there's with t- high performers. There's totally a way. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah. totally yeah. a way. See accelerated gains. As, as soon as you like inject into your culture that that's just not something that you guys accept, then right. you, know, you can take steps to really improve in those two areas. Okay. Yep. So when you start working with uh, any of the businesses that you do and, you know, this, this sort of project management conversation is coming up, do you have a, a set of questions or a way that you go about diagnosing this within a business? How do you as the coach figure out, okay, this is something we need to address? Yeah, I, there's, a, there's a few things that I do. Uh, the first thing that I'll, I'll look at is um, uh, what, what, are, what is their net profit? Okay. And there's, like we said, there's a spectrum. Some companies are pretty good and, and some companies are, are, you know, they're, they're, they have a lot of ground to make up in this area. So I, I look, first of all, what's the net profit? It's negative two to 4%. There's a lot of ground we can make up usually mm-hmm. in project management, especially in this economy, because typically sales aren't the issue with right. a lot of these companies. It's how, you know, how well can and efficiently can you hammer through these projects? So we'll, yeah, we'll look at the net profit percentage. Uh, and, and another thing we'll look at is, um, what is the, uh, uh, gross profit that we're achieving on these projects relative to what we planned on achieving. And then how long did it take us to do those projects relative to what we, what we, what our plan schedule was. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you try to gap, I try to gap them there and just see where the inconsistencies are. So that's the first thing. Just look at the numbers. It can tell you a lot of stories. Um, uh, the second thing I'll just flat out ask the owner who is leading the organization. I'll just say, what do your project management processes look like? Now, somebody who's put intentionality behind their PM processes will give a really good answer. They'll sit there and they'll say, well, how much time do we have? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times, though, I'll hear something like, oh, well, you know, we have great staff. They work really hard. We have good meetings and we just we get at her. Right. We just we have our budget and our schedule and, you know, we just give her. Give her. Yeah, exactly. And you hear like three sentences and you go, "Okay, so they don't have any formal processes they're just out there doing stuff yeah given her is not really a system it's 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 the best it's intended in the best way but it's it's truly not like a a strong piece of infrastructure yeah and paul i I know sometimes you'll even talk to the actual property uh, to the actual project managers within the companies what kind of stuff are you hearing from them where you're like okay this might be a bit of a concern oh yeah uh, one of the exercises that I really like to do is I'll, I'll like call the project manager and I'll say, um, you know, uh, just, you know, nicely, of course, I'll just say, can you, can you break down like, like some of the things that you're doing this week and next week? And, uh, you know, I'll hear, okay, well, I've, I've got a lot on my plate. I'm like, great. All right, let's hear it. So we'll sit there and we'll write out 50 or 60 things and I'll say, okay, uh, you're doing a lot. Like, yeah, we're slammed. I'm like, Okay. And that, that's, that's the, you know, that's the song that I, I hear quite often. And then the next question I'll ask is, where are you at in your budget? And then usually for companies that have a lot of ground to make up in, in the area of project management, I'll hear from the project manager, oh, uh, the budget is handled by like the owner mm. or the budget is handled by accounting. I go, okay, so. So they're not even holding real accountability to it themselves. Yeah, exactly. They don't know where the budget's at. And then I go, okay, well. Where are you at in the schedule? I go, oh, you know, we're, we'll probably be finished, you know, in like August or, you know, something like that. Go, okay. 
Um, when was the last time you uh, uh, updated the schedule? Oh, a co- co- couple months ago. You know, we have it in you know, Excel and it's on the CRM. The client can look at it. Right. And, 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 or you'll hear some answer like that, some arbitrary answer. You're like, okay, so I'm not updating the schedule. You say, okay, well, when did you talk to the client last about the project? Oh, we talk to the client all the time. The client can call me anytime. Text message, email, phone call. I was talking to them this morning. They send me these big emails. And I go, okay. So th- three things are going on. The project manager, the person with the title project manager, isn't managing the budget. Right. Not managing the schedule. Updating the schedule. Communication on the project is out of control. and It's a little disjointed just because the client and the, the project stakeholders sound like they're managing the flow of communication, not the project manager. Mm-hmm. On healthy projects, the reverse is supposed to happen. Yeah, right. So how the question, the natural question is, how are you as an entrepreneur going to lead strategically, methodically, if if the work comes back to you and your project managers aren't really owning their job? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that if I said, if I asked a project manager, where you at in the budget schedule and, and what's your client communication look like? If they gave a really healthy answer, those 50 or 60 things that they listed out would be very different than the first scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you'd, pro- you'd probably see 20, 30% efficiency gains. Yeah, so so you have these conversations, you ask these awesome questions, you get, you know, these answers that that um, tell you a lot. I'm assuming in that example you just gave, like th- those are alarm bells for you. Like, okay, this is definitely something we're going to need to work on with this business owner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, just to maybe add some color to it, can you share with us a real life example of maybe a business or an entrepreneur that you've coached um, where you guys invested in this and, and it was at a you know certain state before and now it's much better? Um, yeah, what, what, what can you tell us uh, about that? You know, we have, uh, you know, and we're, we're a coaching company, right? So like uh, we have- There's lot, probably a lot. Yeah, we have lots and lots of examples of companies gaining a net profit percentage and, and cultures improving and, 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 you know, the, the, the brands improving and customer satisfactions improving referral counts going up and, and all these, and, and, and the owners like, like feeling like they're getting their time back. Like we have a ton of examples, boatloads of examples of this going on. And, um, one of the companies that really stands out in my mind though, um, is, is, a, is a company called Lita Homes run by a fellow named Dave Stevens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The reason why I, I like Lita Homes is because when they came to us about a year and a half ago, they're already pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Great brand, good staff, well-evolved processes already. Um, Dave's already rich. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like he's already at a place where a lot of people want to be, but he came to us and he said, uh, what does perfect look like? Like as it relates to project yeah, management? Yeah, as it relates to just like, yeah, well, he's, he's a construction company, so yeah. it's mostly project management, right? So I said, I said, okay, well, I, I painted the picture of what perfect looks like when you're managing a project um, in context of, of residential construction. Mm. And then Dave said, let's do it. So this is great. As a coach, you got a, like a war horse here. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, let's go do it. And I said, all right. So I started getting all these emails from him at four o'clock in the morning, and I'm an early riser, so I really appreciated that. <laughs> it's like watching these things come through and and he spent um close to a year really refining his project management processes and uh and and yeah it was a good adventure do you want me to break down kind of what we did yeah so there's basically like uh uh five things that we did and keep in mind when we do this for companies it's it's we give them kind of a boutique experience because no company is is uh is is this is the same but Mm -hmm. for dave he was a special case because he already had a lot of really good habits in place but anyways um here's some of the things that we did the first thing that we um injected into his company were really solid employment agreements in his uh uh, office management division like 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 just you know his office staff Mm -hmm. and then specifically in his um, production management division so this was from labor all the way up to project managers. And, and, you know, one of the things I said to him was, okay, we're going to give you good employment agreements. He goes, I got those. I'm like, of course you do. I know you're a really well-run company. Of course you have employment agreements. What do those employment agreements say? And he showed him, was like, that's just a bunch of legal jargon, which is good, necessary. But what we did is we gave him employment agreements that specified exactly what the employees were going to do in exchange for their salaries and in exchange mm-hmm. for the right to work at the company. Um, high fences make good neighbors. That's what we were doing. 
Um, so that was step one. Step two, we injected a in, uh, performance-based point system into his company. So, mm. you know, all those things when you're running a company that tend to just grade on you as an mm-hmm. owner, like list them out. Like uh, people showing up to work late, not keeping the tools clean, not keeping the job site clean, not um, getting their uh, expense cards in, uh, expenses in, the list time goes cards on. in, list goes, like all that stuff. So we went through all roles in his production, like his field management division, and and what we did is we said, okay, um, we're going to grade everybody on uh, whether or not they're doing these things. And what was great in his company, he had a pretty large company, right? So he had a, he had a, like a large test case to work from. What was great is that most of his staff just said, oh, wait a sec, you're just going to give us points and a bonus attached to those points for just doing our job. It was awesome. Just whoosh, all the little things that kind of bug you as an owner, they just stopped happening yeah. with about three quarters of his staff. And then the other staff where they were having difficulties kind of just towing the line and marching to the beat of the drum that we wanted them to, um, to march at, we just, we just dealt with that on a yeah. case-by-case basis. So that was the second thing we did. Yeah. Third thing that we did is we developed resource training manuals for all roles in the company, specifically with project management. We put a ton of focus onto that. And what these manuals do is, is um, they outline very clearly, this is how to manage a budget. This is how to estimate a job. This mm-hmm. is how to build a project schedule. This is how to update the project schedule. In depth. Like this is an instruction manual. Exactly. For all aspects of project mm-hmm. management. So it, once we did that, it became clear to his project management team, this is what good looks like. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then we bolted competency models onto each um, each section of those resource manuals so that people could self-evaluate whether or not they were doing their jobs properly or not. This really helped because when we started doing all these things, some project managers actually either quit or they they were encouraged to leave the organization just because it became clear to us that they weren't able to perform at the level that we needed them to. That's a really interesting point, right? So you you come in and you're like, okay, we're going to change things a bit. We're going to create a standard. And the, the policy creates a culture that kind of self-polices, right? Like the, there's... There are people that go, oh my God, amazing. I've been waiting for this. This makes my life so much easier. It's structured. It's clear. Thank you. That's one set. And then there's a whole other set that goes, I know, what's all this extra paperwork? I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I was fine before. Is that yeah. like, so there's, there's a, there's a very clear divide there. And I think there's a natural filtration process that happens for an organization. And it might be really painful over the short term. You're probably going to lose a body or two, but uh, big picture, it's definitely the right way to go. That's actually exactly what happened. Yeah, and and he was he was happier for it because he said, "Hey, there's no more long goodbyes now. <laughs> like you're either doing your job or you're not." Yeah, <laughs> right? totally. So so th- those were three or four. Was that was that uh, was there anything else uh, on well, on Dave's? Uh, yeah. Well, there are three more things. Um, the the next thing we did after the training manuals was we uh, built a we designed a communication plan, which you know if we have time, I want to talk about later. And the communication plan just. Like, like I think we mentioned earlier, the communication plan um, determines exactly what good communication looks like in the mm-hmm. company. So like we said, that helps relationships to elevate and become better as projects progress. And then the fifth thing that we did is we um, started doing what are called goal set and review meetings. So Dave would meet with the project managers on a weekly or a biweekly basis to assess whether or not they were actually managing the projects properly. So in the meetings, they weren't just talking about whatever, they were talking about budget, schedule, client satisfaction, and any other milestones and things like that that tend to come up in the project on a project-by-project basis. So what it did is it forced the project managers to make sure that they were doing things in context with the key Mm -hmm. um, items that you tend to track to determine if a project's successful. I love that. You've created a roadmap for over-communicating from the project manager to the client and back and forth every single time. It's not just like, hey, we're going to hop on a call. We're going to talk about whatever comes to mind that day. How's the weather? Cool. I'll talk to you next week. It's like, boom, 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 this is what we need to discuss. And that's totally premeditated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yep. Um, amazing. Okay, so I want to, um, I do want to get into sort of some of the the universal fundamentals, right? I'm sure that there are a lot, uh, but what are what are the, the really important ones for contractors, for GCs, for the businesses that you work with? What are the, what are the handful of, principles as you call them that really matter unfortunately if you google fundamentals of project management you're going to see a lot of terminology Mm. um, that doesn't 
really make sense or resonate with uh, people involved in in you know trades businesses and and construction Just companies things like, like Greek. Yeah, quality management plan, which is different than a quality control plan, and integrated values management capabilities, and just all, all these like kind of esoteric terms that people go, okay, I kind of get what they're saying there, but this doesn't apply I'm to me. I'm just trying to get my job done. Right. So, um, so my apologies to anybody from the Project Management Institute who might be listening to this, <laughs> but like if if you interpret a lot of that stuff, which is very good by the way, but if you interpret that and and put it into context for somebody who's um, working specifically with a, in a trades business or general contracting business, I, I really think that there's kind of four uh, uh, key things that that um, um, a good project manager should be um, looking after. Mm. One, uh, so the first thing would be uh, having a good project plan in place. Okay. Okay. The second thing would be managing the budget. The third thing would be managing the schedule. And the fourth thing would be having a really good communication plan. Do you want me to kind of unpack? Just that unpack, yeah. yeah, yeah, like okay. all four of those. Yeah, start, start with the start with the budget, the project plan part. So, building a project plan is is uh, you know when I mentioned that that you know that engineer was super calm all the time. It's the reason why he was able to sit there and sip his coffee and just it's because he knew how to plan projects properly, so that when the project was actually in the construction phase and you had boots on the ground and materials were showing up and all this stuff was being built. Everything was planned properly at the beginning. So when you're lifting up rocks, you weren't really finding snakes under them. Everything just kind of more or less just moved along as it should. So um, a, a good project plan encompasses a, f- a few key things. One, um, a, a developing a really good estimate. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I, I, I build estimates. I, I know how to do that. That's fine. But uh, what separates a, a, a a normal estimator from somebody who's estimating jobs at a really top level or is, is, is the really good estimators know which questions to ask. So mm-hmm. people who are building good project plans, they have a list of premeditated questions that they go through on every single project and it's templated like, you know, for excavation, um, what's the drainage on the site? Can excavated material be used for backfill? You know, all this stuff. And, and, and so that their estimate tends to not leave out a lot of things. So right. there's no weird surprises later on in the project. So that's the first thing. The second thing is having a good material management plan, not just saying which materials are going to arrive on site and when are they going to arrive on site? What are the manufacturing times? How are these materials being shipped? Are they being stored on site? Where are they being stored on site? And you're taking into account all these factors. And there's other things like, uh, making sure your budget line items reflect the estimate, making sure you have a good meeting structures and communication plans mm-hmm. set up in the project, making sure you have a good risk management plan, a good safety plan, and all this stuff. And if it's developed at a really high quality level, then the project, once it's a go, will be executed. Generally flows. Yeah, it'll flow. It's not to say there's no surprises. I'm sure there's still hiccups for your, like, you know, the, the perfect engineer sipping his coffee, but his ability to manage those is so much better because they're few and far between and he's got sort of contingency plans for everything yeah the little fires that flare up um they, they tend to just be little fires yeah. and not just big oh my goodness the window package is not dumpster you know, fires yeah, exactly it's not two months later or whatever good uh, um anything else on the project plan or can you tell us a bit about the budget management there's one more thing i want to actually mention with the project plan uh in my past life i used to interview construction companies and i would when they're working on my projects and I would say, you know, can you please plan a, like describe to me um, what your plan looks like for these jobs? And they would kind of look at me and go, oh, what do you mean? What my plan looks like? I say, well, describe, describe what your plan looks like. They go, well, uh, we're on budget and, and on schedule. And, and, you know, that's kind of what the mantra that they would say. And I'd be thinking, oh, these guys are going to be a disaster. And, and they were, they seemed so much different than sometimes you'd meet just these brilliant companies that say, this is how we plan a project. Yeah. And they would really unpack it and break it down for you. You'd be like, okay, yes, here you go. Here's the project. So that's, anyways, I just really encourage people to, to put a lot of focus and emphasis on building good, solid project plans. I wish we had more time to talk about them, but we'll do another episode. Okay. No worries. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next, uh, th- yeah, the next thing is project budgets. Um, again, uh, this is something that people, they, they, they follow a project budget. They're like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm managing the project budget. I have all my line items and cost codes and things here. But some of the questions that I think a good project manager really needs to be able to uh, answer with respect to the budget is, how are each of my line items performing? Are they performing well or poorly? What's my forecasted gross profit? Mm-hmm. 
okay, for fixed price co- co- uh, um, jobs, what is my over under billings for people that are taking deposits and things like that? Um, uh, uh, they can they can say okay well if my forecasted gross profit is less than what we're planning can they look at their budget and say okay where are areas that we can make up ground can they articulate to the customer how change orders are affecting their budget in a way that doesn't cause the customer to go oh my goodness why didn't you mm-hmm. tell me this sooner mm-hmm. right. cool so that's uh, that's the budgeting piece what about like the scheduling and the critical path yeah this is this is really important um, when Companies ask, oh, how can we make more money? Right away, they automatically think, okay, we've got to charge more. And, and oftentimes that's the case. They can uh, deploy pricing strategy tactics to just get more money for their work and charge more through you know, branding and sales and things like that. But what separates the companies that, that do really, really, really well from the companies that are doing okay is the companies that do really, really well tend to hammer through projects much faster than than other companies They're in speedy. the same industry. Yeah, they just, it's a million dollar job in 10 months. They'll just get it done in 10 months. Whereas like another company, company B, same job, they'll do it in 12 months, which you think, oh, big deal. I still got my million bucks. It was 12 months, but both companies have overhead, mm-hmm. right? So company A, their overhead efficiency is much higher. And that's what co- allows these companies to hit the double digit net profit percentages. So the the pace at which a project gets done, not only affect you're, you're 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 drawing a very strong connection between that and net profit at the end of the year. It's Huge. not yeah. just about yeah well, we got it done on time and the customer's happy. Now we're on to the next. Like when you see businesses that are whose net profit isn't as high as it needs to be, and, and project management is kind of the issue. The reason that that is is they're not getting th- the overhead is fixed. That's the same every month. Yep. They're not getting th- they're they're not. Um, like ramming enough revenue through that overhead month to month. And that's, that's why the NP is like way too low. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yep. The super profitable companies, they're just faster. Right. Okay. So um, the last thing I want to get into here when we're we're talking about like principles, fundamentals is this is like the communication with stakeholders. I've heard you say this many times, like 99% of the issues that happen on site delays are usually like the root cause of that is a communication breakdown. So talk about how you address that with your members. Yeah. Well, uh, I always have a lot of fun with, with these, with communication because often when I mention, okay, well, you know, I can see there's issues here. We need to build what's called a communication plan. People will say we communicate, we have a communication plan. I'm like, well, what does it look like? Well, we have our meetings and we meet with the city and yeah, yeah don't bore me with this stuff. Yeah. Like, we're all good communicators. We have no problem, you know, having the right, you know, it's tough conversations. And you know, here's things like that. I'll say, <laughs> okay, well, um, uh, let's just try this on one project. Let's build a communication plan where, first of all, your stakeholders are listed out. Like who are the key decision makers on the project? Who can come in and affect this project? in a positive or a negative way. Let's figure out who all these people are. Next, let's outline what meetings take place on the project. And this isn't just meetings with the client. This is meetings with um, industry professionals, architects, engineers, city, what inspections are happening, Mm. internal inspections, um, QC inspections, client walkthroughs. When do those inspections happen? Like you should be checking over your project before the client walks through. They should walk through the project, see blue tape everywhere and go, wow, I can't believe all the stuff they caught. I would have never picked that up. I love these guys. What meetings are happening internally? So these would be like daily toolbox meetings, weekly production meetings for the company, uh, goal set and review meetings like we mentioned, right? And, and And then what do the meetings look like with the client? Okay, there needs to, what I'm saying is there needs to be an agenda there where these meetings are specifically designed and, and, pe- and whoever's running the meetings are following a specific agenda. And it's not just, because people will say, I've, I'm holding client meetings. I'll be like, well, what are you talking about right. client meetings? Oh, well, we do meeting minutes. I'm like, okay, show me. And I'll look at all these meeting minutes. I'll be like, the client doesn't care about half that stuff. Yeah. There's 18 change orders and yeah. you haven't told them where their budget's at. They're going to flip out when they see that they're 250 grand over. Right, right. And you'd be surprised how common that is. So... Yeah, I mean, that, that's basically kind of like you could spend quite a long time talking about what good communication plans look like, but that's one of the, one of the key fundamentals of a, of a very strong project is, is just having uh, 
uh, good communication that's well thought out and, and forces the right yeah. conversations to happen early enough to mitigate future issues. So when you when you when you do this with a member and you and you say, hey, you know, just humor me, just just try it once. I know I know you guys are really great communicators already, and you have the tough conversations. I know that, but just try this on this one project. What usually happens? I go, oh, the client isn't calling me as much, right? Because the client's thinking, oh. We're going to talk about this at our project status update meeting, so I don't need to send out a 14-paragraph 14, 14 email. And then the project manager isn't talking to the owner as much because the project manager is going, okay, well, i got this issue, but the owner is just going to tell me, well, can we handle this, talk about this in our GSR that's in two days? Project manager goes, oh, okay. So right away, um, the communication that does happen is higher quality, yeah, right? Which frees up what? time for everybody else and the results follow the yeah results follow yeah cool okay um i love it so we talked about these these are the fundamentals for paul right guys it's 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 dialed project man uh dialed in project planning that happens before anything starts budget management as the job progresses uh creating and managing a schedule plus a, plus a critical path and then um these communication plans with stakeholders that we just that we just touched on um, here. We're going to kind of shift gears here, but I think this is a really important uh, part of the conversation, which is to talk about like what kind of profile makes a really, really strong project manager. I've, I've got to assume that there's a kind of person that really thrives in this role based on how they're wired. Can you maybe share what you've learned about that? Strong project managers, uh, they have to be very instrumental Okay, the, the project Can you tell us what you mean by instrumental? Uh, they have to come across to other people as very capable and competent. Right. Mm. The reason, the reason if, if, if a project manager loses their cool on the site or they don't project confidence and, and, uh, and like a little bit of toughness, then you're going to notice um, the rest of the, or the, 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 all the people reporting to them are going to uh, kind of lose faith in, in what the project team is trying to accomplish. Mm. Really important that your project manager... Um, they just they just communicate in their body language. They know what's going on. Problems are always going to arise, of course, but it's how the project manager addresses those issues. That's what's going to allow the project to be successful or not. So that's so the first big high one. instrumental, cool. high high instrumental. Yep, for sure. Um, the second thing is the project manager needs to be a really good problem solver. There there are people out there calling themselves project managers that can't solve problems. They're always calling you know their boss, the owner of the company four or five, six times a day, just, oh, well, you know, what about what this? And the here? owner's like, you should know this by now. You've been working at my company for two years. So project managers need to be really good problem solvers. I, would, I just want to digress for a little, for a little bit. Uh, if you want to train your staff to be good problem solvers, one of the little tricks that I, 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 I tell my guys to do is when your staff come to you with a question, tell them to a answer three questions first. What is the issue? Because a lot of times people don't even know what the issue is. They just want to come and Complain, complain to the owner and take up lots of time. So what is the issue? In my professional opinion, what are three ways to solve the issue? And then, in my professional opinion, again, if I wasn't able to talk to the owner or someone senior to me, what, uh, what solution would I pay? What, so what path would I take to solve this problem? And so then you're training people to actually think and become problem solvers when they can't just pick up the phone and call the owner, right? That, that's, it's, it's sort of a coaching tool. You're, exactly. you're, you're saying like... What what do you think you should do in this situation? And then nine times out of ten, they come up with a passable answer, probably. And then every once in a while, they need some further help or a little bit of explanation. But you're you're putting the onus of the critical thinking back on the person rather than just coming to your desk and saying, "I've got a fire. Can you put it out?" Exactly. Yeah. You you, you need project managers that can actually. You need to be able to trust that your project management team could solve problems without you being physically present because as an, as an owner of a company, you're got a whole entire world of, of other uh, stuff tasks that yeah. you're trying to take care of. You can't be bothered with a lot of these things that tend to come up on a day to day or week to day, week mm -hmm. to week basis on the project. So that's the second thing, problem solving. Uh, the third thing is project managers have to be very, very tenacious. Mm. Okay. Um, a lot of the times people will say a project manager should be very precise, like a perfectionist. Like let's just, you know, make sure every, you know, nut is turned a certain way and, you know, the paint's a certain way and everything, you know. Um, un unfortunately, uh, un like unless you're launching satellites into space, a lot of the times perfection is the enemy of profitability. We just huh. don't have time to be perfect. Right. Unless the customer is like willing to pay for it. But a lot of the times... They're not. They're not. 
And so uh, we can't have project managers get bogged down in these super high details. Um, the most successful project managers are very tenacious. You know, they're just they're like that bulldog. They just start at your calf and work their way up to their neck, and they just get the project done. They just and, and it's these people that can get through the projects very, very quickly. Right. Okay. And and that's a very critical skill that project managers actually must, 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 must have. Yeah. So w- without it, you're like, oh, we will get to it next week. Well, yeah, they just, you know, oh, let's not do the concrete pour yeah, because yeah. it's a long weekend no. and let's delay it to next week. It's just like, no, man, like if we got to stay an extra two hours, we're getting this done. We got to go. I love that. And the other thing, too, is like like the, the project manager is in a position organizationally where other people are looking at them. Like yeah. the, if, if you have somebody that doesn't have that, it's not just the project manager that moves slower. It's everybody on site that's reporting to them, too. So there's a... It's a, it's a very leveraged role, and I can see why that tenacity piece is so big. So we're saying um, uh, we're saying really high instrumental, very confident. They look, yep. they come across as competent, and that that leads to um, you know fewer questions. There, there isn't a nagging doubt in everyone's mind. Hey, has this person got what it takes to do it? They just kind of trust that they do. That's a great thing. You talked about a really high ability to solve problems, and then tenacity. So those yep. are the three things. Yep, for sure. Are there common mistakes that you see? GCs, custom home builders, just construction companies, or really anyone in, in, in trades um, make when it comes to hiring project management, uh, project managers, are there common mistakes there? Systems wise in a company, I think, I think there's some pretty common mistakes that people will make. They won't have good recruitment strategies set up in place. So um, their ability to attract the right people is lacking. So, that, you know, that's one that we don't have time to talk about what good recruitment strategies look like, but that's definitely a mistake. If you don't have if your recruitment strategy is posting a job ad online and that's it, that's bad. Right. Um, so, I'll, you know, I'll say that. But one common mistake that we often see are, are people going, hey, look at this guy's resume. He yeah. worked on this site with this and he was a project manager of all these. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. But in the interview, they don't actually verify that the project manager has actually been managing projects often because the term project manager has been diluted. Right. These people are glorified site supervisors that aren't actually doing project management stuff. So they come into the company and the owner thinks, great, I'm just going to like leave them with, you know, $5 million worth of projects and, and, uh, and now I can focus on this other stuff. And then six months later you go, oh, like I said, you're lifting up rocks, you start finding snakes under them, right? That's a very common mistake. Don't just look at a fancy resume and don't just, when you meet the person, don't just project what you want them to be without actually taking them through a methodical interview process where you're breaking down, do they actually know what project management is, are they capable of, because sometimes people, um, they may not have ex- like tons of experience managing projects, but they're just good project managers. And with a year of good intentional training, they can be amazing at it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So. It's awesome. So don't don't overvalue the, the long resume. Oh, I mean, it, yeah. th- it could yeah. mean something, but don't just take it at face value. You need to look for those other qualities that you'd mentioned before, and you need to validate that they were actually project managing on these sites. Yeah, learn how to interview for those things specifically. Yeah. Okay, I want to... Um, I, th- I want to end with this, Paul. Like we, we've we've talked about so much awesome stuff today. Um, great example of how it can change uh, a business. In in like we talked about uh, Lita Holmes, Dave Stevens. Uh, we talked about what good uh, project managers actually look like. We went through the principles. We went through the profile. This is obviously quite a bit of work. Why would this be so important for a listener to get going on this now? If this is indeed a need of theirs. Well, the thing that I tell uh, the thing that I tell companies is this: um, trades, businesses, and general contracting exists in a space that's quite fragmented. Mm-hmm. I can promise you that wherever your company is operating out of, whether it's like Madison, Wisconsin, or Houston, Texas, or you know Vancouver, British Columbia, I can promise you that the majority of the businesses that you are in competition with are uh, lacking in in how they execute and manage uh, uh, execute plan and manage projects as a business owner if you take the time to get good in this area you're going to see accelerated gains because most of the people that you're in um, competing against aren't doing this so there's an opportunity huge opportunity here right it's not like you you know we're working in a space where all our competitors are are 
performing at a this. super competent yeah. level. Which is the case in other industries, by oh, the way. 100%. Yeah. 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 Like if you look at auto manufacturers, for example. like They got this stuff like dialed. Project management at Ford and project management in Hyundai. It's, it's really good. Yeah. Right. Big tech's the same. Big tech. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. But contracting, they're the... It's, it's, it's actually fair to say the bar is kind of low and that for Very you low. as an entrepreneur is a huge opportunity to kind of grab this behind the horns and, and master it. Yeah, 20 years from now, um, I think all the stuff that we're seeing here is going to be more run of the mill as, mm. as you know, the, the, the industry kind of evolves. Right now, it's like the Wild West, okay? Like you, you really got to go after there and get it. I love it. Um, Paul, this has been a really powerful conversation and uh, thank you for being here. Please come back and do another one. Awesome. Yeah, I will. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Hey, if you enjoyed this show, hit that subscribe button. It's what allows us to produce more awesome content for you totally for free.